Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a bit strange talking to a camera for me, uh, but I'm imagining that in my head you are all here and sharing the Word of God together. It's a privilege to be able to share this Word with you. Today I'm going to talk about something we're all familiar with, suffering. The title of today's talk is Suffering Demonstrates Christ's Redemption. Suffering demonstrates Christ's redemptive work. And our main Bible quote for today is from Colossians 1.24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Suffering. None of us is immune to suffering. We don't like it, but we know it's there in this world. Many ask, why do we have suffering in the world? That's a big question, and I will not attempt to answer every aspect of that question. Instead, today, I'll talk about the Christian's response to suffering and look at how suffering fits within God's plan of redemption. The following are my own thoughts on what God has been teaching me in my own life. I may not be right, but I submit, humbly submit my words for your consideration. My prayer is that you will receive something that is of use to you. Well, to begin, to begin with, I'd like to share a little bit about my own background. I was not born into a Christian family, and I became a Christian at the age of 19. And initially, I must admit, I was attracted to Christian teachings because it seemed to me that Christians suffered less than non-Christians. Christians talked about having joy and peace, which I didn't have. And I even remember a Christian telling me, a, pot a potential convert, that life would be so much better once you became Christian, Patrick. Plus, I was also afraid of hell, which they told me was eternal suffering. So, without really understanding everything, I decided to become a Christian. Once I became a Christian, the Lord gave me great joy, joy that I'd never experienced before. It was a supernatural thing the Lord did for me. But then, after a period, period of time when the euphoria wore off, I realized my suffering had not decreased. My external problems changed very little. I still had, I still had problems with my universe, university studies. In addition, my non-Christian friends started saying to me that I was now weird because of my newfound religious belief. I remember a friend at university told me to my face, Patrick, you've changed. You're not the Patrick I know, and I don't think I want to hang out with you anymore. I was shocked, and I remember that day going into a university cubicle and crying. My family members, some of whom are Christians today, and I praise God for that, at that stage when I first became a Christian, many of them were not Christian and they did not understand my conversion to Christianity. Family relationships were strained, and I was part of the problem because of my own immaturity. On top of that, I started to come across verses in the Bible, like uh, John 16.33, which says, you will have suffering in this world, and Acts 14.22, where it says, we have to suffer a lot before we can get into God's kingdom. Slowly, I began to realize, much to my disappointment, that suffering is a normal part 
of the Christian life. And this is your first fill-in on the sermon note today. Suffering is a normal part of the Christian life. It's normal. Now, I was not about to give up on my faith, but I had questions and I had some major rethinking to do. What had I gotten myself into, I would ask myself. This Christian life is not a bed of roses, a bed of roses. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. It says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. This verse has helped me enormously. It normalizes suffering for me. It says, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal, the test of faith. In it, we're faced with a choice. Do I choose the easy path of not leaning on God? Or do I follow God, do the right thing, which often involves suffering? Suffering cannot be avoided. I want to pause for a moment and touch on what I see as three main kinds of suffering we have to deal with in this world. Firstly, there is suffering that results from following God, such as persecution from non-believers. Secondly, I believe there is suffering that comes from simply living in this fallen world. It's sinful. so. In this fallen world, we have accidents, natural disasters, and the deterioration of our bodies over time. Thirdly, there is also suffering which is a consequence of our own sin. For example, if I steal, I will be arrested. I suffer for my sin. Now, the Christian is not immune from the first two kinds of suffering. We are sometimes persecuted. We suffer because we follow Christ. And because we live in this world, we sometimes suffer because of the fallen nature of our world. The non-Christian, on the other hand, suffers mainly from the second and the third type of suffering. And the third type of suffering is, of course, suffering because you sin. So we all suffer. But I've also noticed there is a difference between the non-Christian and the Christian when it comes to suffering. Nowadays, many non-Christians think that we should always reduce suffering if at all possible. So some people have worldviews like this. So for example, they may say, if something causes you suffering, you should get rid of it. For example, does your relationship cause you suffering? then get out. Why stay? Or they may say, are you single, pining for touch and lonely? Then go out and have fun. Fornication is not a sin, they would say. Or they may say, are you committed to beliefs that cause you suffering? Then get rid of those beliefs. There's even a view that if your belief system condones suffering, then you're somehow condoning an evil belief system, and I've heard that before too. So on all counts, the non-Christian will often avoid suffering and say that suffering is always bad. This thinking has crept into the church as well. I'll give you an example. I once had a Christian friend who sometimes visited prostitutes. You heard right. This was a Christian friend. He was a Christian man, single, and would sometimes visit prostitutes. He was not part of this church, but I knew him from a men's group I attended at another congregation. This man would confess his sin to the men's group as a weakness, but he would fall again and again. And it seemed no amount of counseling or small groups could help him. I was puzzled. 
Eventually, his church elders became very strict with him. They told him to repent or stop attending the church. So my friend called me on the phone and he said, Patrick, I can't believe what the elders did. What they're doing is not right. God wants me to have an abundant life, it says in the Bible. He doesn't want me to suffer. The elders are not kind and they're not Christ-like. That was his belief. Eventually, even I had to tell him, you must repent. So he said, I was too harsh and he has not talked to me since. I reflect on this and I think that his unwillingness to repent was linked to his unwillingness to suffer. My friend knew that he would suffer when he stopped sinning. Now, my friend was not suffering for Jesus', Jesus namesake. He was suffering in sin, and he knew that there would also be suffering in his journey out of sin. Sin causes suffering. He wanted to wean himself off of the sin slowly with no suffering involved. He wanted God to take away the suffering before he would change. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. Once you're steeped in sin, there is suffering when you fight to get out. My friend used Bible verses to justify continual sin in order to avoid suffering. He did not realize that suffering is actually a normal part of the Christian life. Now, we may not all think like this friend of mine, but it's worth examining ourselves to see if we're also trying to avoid suffering in our Christian walk. We may say to ourselves, I don't want to suffer the loss of reputation, so I'm not going to witness to my colleagues. Or sometimes we would say to ourselves, well, I don't want to suffer the loss of my comfortable lifestyle, so I don't want to give to missionaries. Or we may think, well, I'll suffer if I don't indulge myself in this unhealthy food. So we go ahead and we indulge in unhealthy eating habits. Or we say to ourselves, I'll suffer if I don't spend money on this thing I must have. Brothers and sisters, I'm no, be no better. I have also thought all these thoughts and done all these things. I don't like suffering either. But in order to walk God's path for me, I know now there is suffering involved. I've grown to accept suffering. Suffering is, indeed, a normal part of the Christian life. So, how are we to endure this thing called suffering? I believe the key to endurance is to listen and believe in God's promises. In Revelation 2.10, the Lord, speaking about the suffering and persecution the church in Smyrna was about to endure, said this, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's Revelation 2.10. The crown of life. The hope of receiving that crown, I believe, helped Christians in Smyrna to endure. So I believe hope is the secret weapon in our life of suffering. If we hope in God and his promises, we will be able to endure. In my prayers recently, being encouraged by the uh, series on Revelation, uh, I've been trying to imagine what it will be like in heaven. I actually spend a few moments each day in prayer now thinking about the glories of heaven that await us. Never forget that, believers. The glories of heaven await you and a crown of life awaits you. We do well to ponder on these wonderful things even as we walk this life of suffering on earth. We'll talk more about hope in the next section. Let's go to the second section. The second point I want to look at today is that
Suffering demonstrates Christ's redemptive work. Suffering demonstrates Christ's redemptive work. So your fill in here is demonstrates. Now, I want to emphasize that God is not the author of suffering. Suffering came, as we know, as a result of the fall. Yet, a Christian's suffering can somehow work mysteriously as part of God's redemptive plan. Let's look at the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus. What did he do? Well, even Jesus had to go through suffering to be perfected in obedience. How do we know? Let's look at Hebrews 5, 8. It says, Even though Jesus was God's Son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Now, I don't fully understand this. Would not Jesus' obedience still have been perfect even if he had not suffered? But the Bible clearly says he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Somehow, it seems, in God's redemptive plan, Jesus had to suffer to learn obedience. So the pattern of Jesus' life was suffering, death, resurrection. We, as Christians, all also follow this pattern. Why? Because we're in union with him. We're in union with him because in Colossians 2.10, and this is in your notes, it says, so you also are complete through your union with Christ. Colossians 2.10. Just as he suffered, we suffer. Have you ever wondered why Jesus' suffering was so open? Fully seen, he was paraded before all, made a spectacle um, in front of of, uh, of everybody in full sight of his full enemies. I believe his sufferings are graphically portrayed so that we will not be surprised if in, one, if in some small way we follow in his sufferings. Now, none of us will suffer as much as Christ did, but all of us, I submit to you, will suffer some because the pattern is Suffering, death, resurrection. Romans 8, 17 says, If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. If we suffer with him, we will also share in his resurrection glory. Now this is only possible because we are already in union with him. These things are too deep for me to understand. But it's almost as if God, in his wisdom, is allowing us to taste suffering so that we may share in what Christ has achieved. And this is indeed a privilege. We know that Christ defeated death and sin and the devil through his suffering and death. It was all part of God's redemptive plan from the very beginning. Now, for us who benefit from God's redemptive plan, our suffering, I think, is like a demonstration, a demonstration of what he has achieved. And I also think of it this way, that, su that Christ is suffering with us, sharing his suffering with us so that we may truly be one. Or I sometimes think of it as I mirror, mirroring his suffering. We mirror his suffering so that it will be demonstrated to all the world that we are just like him, together, never to be separated. 1 Peter 4.13. Let's look at that. This is the next verse after verse 12, which we read earlier. It says this, But rejoice in as much as you participate Sorry, inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. 1 Peter 4, 13. We reflect Christ, we reflect Christ 
in every possible way. Suffering and then glory. When suffering comes, we are told in 1 Peter 4.13 to rejoice. In fact, we are told to rejoice to the extent that we participate in his sufferings. If we suffer a lot, we rejoice a lot. As we rejoice, we discover hope. Like Jesus, who, as described in Hebrews 12.2, it says this in Hebrews 12.2, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Like him, we also endure. I want to submit to you that hope is the counterpoint to suffering. Like Jesus, we also look forward to our future glory while we suffer now. For the joy set before him, we say for the joy set before us. We never choose to let go of hope. No, not even in the midst of suffering. This again demonstrates how Christ carried out his mission on earth. We demonstrate Christ's redemptive plan by doing the same thing. Romans chapter 5 verses 3 to 4 makes it even clearer. It says, Romans 5, 3 to 4, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Suffering, endurance, character, hope. Note that hope is the apex, it's the peak, it's the grandest of them all. Hope is actually something we as Christians can experience more and more as we suffer. We begin with hope, maybe a small hope in God's promises, and we end with more hope, greater hope. Now this is, this is very counterintuitive, and it's not at all how the world operates. In the world, the more people suffer, the less hope they usually retain. Christian supernatural hope come, overcome, becomes a demonstration of God's redemptive plan, a light for all to see. Another way suffering demonstrates Christ's redemptive work is by showing us that suffering is linked to denying oneself and defeat of sin. Again, I must confess I don't fully understand this, but it is a clear pattern in Scripture. Defeating sin involves suffering as part of the process. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, the Lord warned us, if we're to become his disciples, he says, in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, taking up one's cross involves suffering. It's not a pleasant experience. Yet, the very next verse, Matthew 16, 25, says, We will save our lives if we voluntarily lose our lives. The pattern here is, again, suffering, death, resurrection. In our struggle against sin, there is suffering too. We don't talk about this much, maybe not enough. But repentance may result in pain. We can't tell people to repent if we don't warn them that turning away from sin may involve pain. Hebrews 12.4 tells us there is, a, there is the possibility of shedding of blood or physical suffering in our struggle against sin. Hebrews 12.4 says, In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. The writer of Hebrews, I believe, is implying that for some, struggle against sin may actually involve brutal physical suffering. 
This graphically demonstrates, doesn't it, Christ's war against sin, because he certainly suffered in his battle against sin. I believe suffering also demonstrates God's redemptive plan because suffering is actually a part of knowing Christ. Now, we know that the whole point of salvation is for God to be glorified, right? Now, part of this glorification is for us to know him and for him to know us. So it's interesting to read that Paul actually regarded the fellowship of his sufferings as a part of knowing Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, we actually read about suffering, death, and resurrection, all three in one verse. Let's read it. Philippians 3.10 I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to him in his death. Paul actually says, I want to experience this. Suffering to Paul was part of knowing Christ. Suffering may also be part of your ministry. For some people, like Paul, suffering was always God's plan for them. How do we know this? We know that when Jesus called Paul in Acts chapter 9, he actually said this, I will show him, Paul, how much he must suffer for my name. So for some people, it's actually part of God's plan. So, as we've seen in this section, through suffering we learn obedience. Because of our union with Christ, we are destined to share in his suffering, death and resurrection. Suffering, although painful, produces hope in us. And suffering is linked to denying oneself and the defeat of sin. Furthermore, suffering is actually part of knowing Christ. This gives us a newer perspective on suffering, doesn't it? Finally, at the end of this section, I'd like to share one more remarkable scripture with you. It's also our main Bible quote for today. Let's read it, read it again, Colossians 1.24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Interesting scripture. Paul is actually saying that somehow there is a part he is playing in Christ's afflictions for the church. Paul's suffering, some of his suffering at least, was not just for himself, but for the church as well. I believe there are some people who are called to share Christ's afflictions in this way. It's a kind of suffering that is entered into voluntarily for the sake of Christ's body. This is probably the highest form of suffering and fully demonstrates Christ's redemptive work. I don't know if you're called to this, but it's a very special type of suffering. So we've seen in the second section that Christ, uh, that uh, suffering demonstrates Christ's redemptive work. Let's go to my third point today. My third point today is the meaning of your suffering may be for others to see. Not for you, for others to see. So your fill-in here is others. I want to apply this especially to what some would call undeserved suffering or suffering that doesn't make sense. Mostly, this is the second type of suffering we talked about early today. Sometimes suffering doesn't come as a result of us doing the right thing, but as a result of just living in this fallen world. Out of nowhere, it seems, suffering comes. Someone we love dies. We come down with a debilitating or painful illness. Through no fault of our own, we get injured in an accident. We suffer loss or damage to property. We suffer financial loss 
someone cheats us of our money, someone cheats on us in a relationship, betrayal, war, natural and man-made disasters, epidemics and pandemics, the list goes on and on. There seems no end to the variety of suffering possible in this fallen world. After an exposition on the great heroes of faith, Hebrews 12.1 says, We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. That's Hebrews 12.1. The previous chapter, chapter 11, indicates that some of these witnesses are in heaven now. Can it be that our private and painful stories of suffering and faith are being seen even by heavenly beings above? Are there those in heaven who are quietly cheering us on and writing our stories in biographies to be published in heaven? I don't know, but I do know this, that people here on earth are certainly watching. In John chapter 9 verses 1 to 12 we read the story of a man born blind. We know that at the time some people believed that if you were suffering it must have been because you had sinned or your parents had sinned. Even Jesus disciples believed this and they asked Jesus, okay this man was born blind. Who sinned? This man or his parents? Jesus answered them in John 9, 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now imagine, this man had suffered all his life. Right? He was blind from birth, and so Imagine the loss of economic and other opportunities. He was begging. He couldn't work. And think of the ridicule and the derision he suffered from people who thought that he deserved to be born blind because of sin. And imagine, if you will, how his parents must have felt, wondering if they might have done something wrong in their past to give birth to a blind child. But Jesus took all that and he said, this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in the blind man. Displayed at the right time, not before, and displayed for the world to see. All those years of suffering for this day of glory we know this formerly blind man later also gave an uncompromising testimony in front of unbelieving Pharisees. You can read the rest of this exciting story in John chapter 9 for yourself. As a result, he was thrown out by the Pharisees. That too was suffering. Now we don't know what happened to him after that, but I rather fancy that he became a powerful evangelist the rest of his life. No one could take away the power of this personal testimony. His words also became one of the most quoted verses in Scripture. Verse 25, I was blind, but now I see. The blind man's suffering eventually led to the redemption of others. My point here is that your suffering, if you will submit it to God, can be a means by which the glory of God may be shown to others, if not to yourself. We don't know why this suffering, this painful suffering, happened to you, my brother, my sister, and I am sorry that happened to you. I have no answers. Just like I don't know why that particular man 
excuse me, in the Gospel of John, had to suffer for years and years and years before Jesus came. But we know the end story, don't we? The man was blind, he now saw, and it gave glory to God. I believe there is a testimony brewing in your veins. I know it's easier to give up to say, I'm going to give up on life. But hear me out. Don't. Please don't give up. Please continue walking with God through this suffering. At the right time, your testimony will give glory to God. Non-Christians will listen to you. I'll tell you why. Everyone relates to unexplained suffering. A non-Christian will not relate to you if you say you suffer because you refuse to sin. But they will relate to you when you say you don't know why your child has become delinquent. They will relate to you when you say you have lost the child through miscarriage. Why? Because it happens to them too. These things do happen, unfortunately, in our fallen world. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. What a heavy, heavy verse. When sin entered our world through the fall, all kinds of suffering came in plus death. Romans 8.22 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. When sin came into the world, it also brought senseless destruction towards to all God's creation. We all suffer from it. But Christian, you are able to miraculously use the experience of suffering to give glory to, to, give glory to God. Non-Christians will be amazed at how you have dealt with your suffering. I would encourage you, if it is appropriate, to let your suffering be made known. It's not always possible, but if you can tell your story, how you have walked this journey of suffering together, with the Lord Jesus, I guarantee you that you will glorify God with your story. Even non-Christians cannot deny your testimony. This happened to you, that you may demonstrate the works of God. And you know, we have not reached the end of your story. No, not yet. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, for now, we see through a glass darkly. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We see through a glass darkly. Sometimes our stories of suffering seem to end the long way. For example, a suffering wife prays for her husband to be saved, only to have him walk out on her. A wayward child never seems to come back home to the Lord. We get ashamed of these stories. We think they cannot be retold because they haven't ended neatly. But I want to say that we should not be ashamed because the stories have not truly ended. Paul said these three things abide in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. He said, faith, hope, and love abide. They will not disappear. So we choose to hold on to our faith, hope all things, and love until the very end. We have not come to the end of history, brothers and sisters. Things are not set yet. The final judgment is yet to come. Your story is not finished. So we will choose to have faith that the story will end for his glory, and all will be revealed on the other side. And it will be, I believe, just as it was always meant to be. And this is the hardest thing to do for a Christian 
to believe him in our sufferings because we don't see the end, not yet. Still, we choose to believe the end will be just as glorious as we have always believed. We believe and hold on to this truth. So brothers and sisters, I encourage you, just as I encourage myself, to embrace suffering. We heard today suffering is normal. It does demonstrate God's redemptive work and it will be used to display the glory of God to others. But I want to say this, embrace suffering, but don't embrace evil. You don't have to let yourself be abused by deliberate sin. I believe it is a biblical, biblical principle, if you're under a cruel master, that you stay there and give glory to God. But Paul also said to get out from under a cruel master if you are given the opportunity. So, and I want to say this seriously, if you are suffering abuse, please seek wise counsel from your church leaders and wise counsellors. In Proverbs 11:14, it says, In the multitude of counsellors there is safety. You will be shown what to do. But whatever you do, please, please don't suffer alone. Today, we talked about how we are not to shy away from suffering. But what if you're suffering right now? What should you do? Is there something I can do if I'm suffering right now? James 5.13 is a key verse here, I believe. James 5.13 says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Suffering leads to prayer. Cheerfulness leads us to praise. We often just want the praise but it doesn't work that way. Both prayer and praise glorify God, and suffering can glorify God as much as cheerfulness. So, in, obe in obedience to James 5.13, I'd like to conclude by praying for those suffering right now, because it does say, if you're suffering, pray. Let us pray. Father God, I want, to, I want to pray for those suffering right now. They may be suffering because of the name of Jesus. They may be suffering because we live in this fallen world. They may even be suffering because of their own sin. But whatever the reason, Father, I pray that you'll have mercy on all of us. Lead us not into more suffering than is needed to form Christ in us. Lead us not into trials, but deliver us from evil. And we also pray, not my will, not our will, but yours be done. Thank you, Father. We know that you always look after us, and our stories have not finished. This is not the end. We thank you and pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, to conclude today, you will find prayer and discussion points uh, on the screen and also on the church website. I would like us to discuss uh, examples of suffering. Do you know... Uh, or give examples of suffering as a result of walking uprightly with God. Talk about examples of suffering that are a result of living in this fallen world. And then in points three and four, I'd like us to pray. If you're suffering, please pray with those around you or by yourself. And let's not forget those around us. You may be cheerful, but you probably know someone who is suffering, and this is a good time for us to intercede for them.
Thank you for letting me share today. It's been a privilege. I pray that the word of God will speak, in, uh, speak into our hearts and that he will take whatever I've said that is of the word and retain it and then ignore the rest.